Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and with Kerbal Space Program 1.2 uh, about to be released, uh, I thought I would take a look at something which uh, have been in the game for a long time and are getting a bit of a, an expansion, let's say, in this release. These would, of course, be the anomalies. So one of the things that the new Kerbal Space Program has is colliders for all these anomalies so we can crash our planes into things and completely break them. Yay! Actually, there's been a whole lot more added to the the monoliths. The more, well, a whole lot more anomalies added to the game and apparently we've also had some new wheel physics which appears to be working marvelously on this little thing. A perpetual motion machine, it would appear. Still going, in fact, going faster. And still it spins. Jeb, wake up! You're in the dream world! Werner is mad at me. He says that in this space program, we respect the laws of thermodynamics. So the official patch notes for Kerbal Space Program 1.2 said that they have added hidden fun stuff to almost every planet. So I had to go out and using the new Kerbnet feature, find some of these. However, being a very busy person with uh, cheating skills, I just do it the easy way. We basically open up the debug menu using Alt F12 on PC, and I'll set the thing in orbit around one of the bodies. So for example, Drez, you can bring up the curb net using the right click button and then adjust your field of view. It's also good to set the refresh cycle to be regular so that you get updates regularly. And then narrow the field of view to capture the whole body and now just time accelerate around it. Now, there is a little niggle here in that the largest probe body only has a 30% chance of discovering any anomaly. So if they're there, you might not actually see them. You might need to switch to various other planets, but look, we found one here. Setting the waypoint, and then we can actually see it on the world map. That waypoint is shared between all of your spacecraft, so then you can either fly a spacecraft out manually, or cheat one out there. I, of course, having not very much time, decided to use the cheating route. At least I didn't use infinite fuel. So, we've modified the two-stage lander to add the 2.5 meter probe, because only probes have curb net access. Even if you have a full crew of scientists, it is all for naught if you do not have a probe body. And furthermore, you need a connection back to base. So in this case, while I have a dinky little antenna on top of this, I have a satellite in orbit which is relaying all the data back. This does mean that sometimes I lose curb net access when I uh, move out of range or whatever. Incidentally, the game re-rolls the anomaly discovery chances whenever a an SOI, Sphere of Influence, change happens. So if you don't find something, you can just switch to another probe and another SOI and then come back. And just keep iterating on that until you actually get it. Simply saving and reloading does not work. And the discovered objects aren't preserved over a, a restart of the game. Also, the anomaly discovery chance is irrespective of altitude or range. So it doesn't matter if you're way up at the edge of the sphere of influence looking down with a wide field of view, you will have the same chance of discovering the anomalies at this time. This may change in a future version, and I hope they do. I would like to see some sort of distinction between uh, small, focused, low-level surveys and high, broad surveys. The other thing to see me messing with here is I'm trying to figure out where I'm going. And the problem is that when you place a waypoint, it's kind of of dubious accuracy. It's rarely going to be exactly on top, especially if you've placed your waypoint from a very high altitude. So this is why I'm carrying the curb net thing with me so that I can actually refine my position as I'm going down. The orientation of the map will flip when your orbit changes direction, so it can be very confusing trying to target things using this. Instead, you'll create the waypoint and then have to go into the map and somehow figure out which one you just created. Uh, or you could just delete the last ones, but that's always something that you may not be wanting to do when you're falling towards the surface of a planet. Caught in gravity's inexorable embrace. And you'll also notice here that I keep pointing the spacecraft downward. Surely I wouldn't want to do that, except 
that when you create a navigation point, it only shows you one point. It doesn't show a reciprocal point. This is fine if you're using those navigation points to find stuff on planets with atmospheres where you can fly around like a plane. But if you're landing lunar module style, you're essentially reversing in towards the target and you can't actually tell if you're on target or not. So I end up having to turn around and then refine things. You see at this point, I've managed to actually lose the anomaly. It's almost at the edge of the map here because it's really kind of hard to figure out the navigation here. Granted, I pro will probably figure things out with a few more tries, but all the same, it does seem to be rather difficult. Anyway, at this point, the eagle-eyed among you should be able to spy the anomaly. This is on uh, Ike, which hasn't previously had a surface anomaly for a while, of course, it had the magic boulder. Which was, of course, even harder to find than your regular anomalies because it wouldn't uh, it wouldn't stay still, so you couldn't just go to standard coordinates and find it. Anyway, I'm now moving in. Anyway, now you've seen me find it, I'm just going to ex time accelerate down, bring it in, and you can see it's another monolith. Um, incidentally, if you've got ground scatter on, one way to recognize an anomaly versus ground scatter is that the anomalies will cast shadows, whereas ground scatter does not. And yes, um, uh oh, problem, kept things straight up. Uh, that's what happens when you bounce in low gravity. You bounce so fast that the reciprocal, the retrograde uh, SAS option remains on. But here we go, let's go and take a jump, fly towards the the magnificent anomaly. Uh, yeah, so this is a monolith, they are all through the system. And I'm going to be honest, I have looked around, I've looked at several of the supposed hidden and fun surprises that were described in the patch notes. Every single new one that I have found has been a monolith. I mean, maybe monoliths are Squad's idea of fun. Uh, you know, maybe they have a complete collection of 2001 action figures, including the monolith in the original packaging. Made of high quality black plastic in authentic 1 to 4 to 9 ratios and featuring zero points of articulation. The monolith action figure is an essential addition to any sci-fi action figure collection. Okay, uh, yeah. Anyway, one of the fun things I guess about Ike incidentally is that because it's tidally locked to uh, Duna and is on a slightly eccentric orbit, we can accelerate time from this point of view and observe the libration of Duna. Watch this, it's kind of cute, this thing. Now while the whole of the sky, the planets and everything else will move around as Ike rotates, if we look at Duna, it will kind of oscillate back and forth. And this is because the orbit of Ike is eccentric. When Ike is at Periduna, it will appear in this case to move towards the right as it were moving faster. Then we're at Apoduna and it appears to move to the left in this case. Magnificent! Anyway, embracing the power of the cheat menu, I uh, bring an entire aircraft out to Laith. Laith, of course, has another point of interest, and from this distance I can already see its black boxy monolithness is standing proud among the shores of Laith. And I'm sure that did something to mess up my landing approach. Quick! Bail out! No! Ah! Uh, that was Jebediah! Jebediah, no! Bill manages to escape, however. Oh wow, watch the wreckage falling after us. <laughs> well, the good news is that if we have to bury Jeb, we already have a wonderful memorial for him right here. Of course, because this planet has oxygen, it probably has life, which means his body will probably rot, unlike most Kerbals, whose bodies will be uh, preserved forever in the vacuum of space. Val previously, of course, had Valhenge as one of the more interesting anomalies. But it too gets a new monolith action figure, part of a set of 20. Collect them all. The developers, of course, did have a sense of humour. They put it on a super, super steep slope. And even in the low gravity of Val, your uh, capsules are probably going to end up sliding down the hill. To be fair, it does look like a giant ski resort. Hey, we even get a monolith out on Elu. Perhaps there is some new hidden feature I'm not seeing. Who knows? These are supposed to be mysterious. 
But it's not all monoliths. I'm sure you have noticed about the communication system. These uh, connect to locations on the surface of Kerbin, and using the green lines of communication, you can actually triangulate and find the communication systems. So yeah, you just deorbit at the appropriate location, somehow conspire to survive re-entry, possibly with the help of the ignore max temperature cheat option. And uh, yeah, once you get in close enough, we can take a, a look out of the cockpit. And there it is. Doesn't look like much, but that thing will be your lifeline. It will send you all the data, your experiments, your messages back home. Terrible sketches of spaceships that you would love if they were by your first grade child, but in fact are by Bill. But of course, these are also your partners in crime in finding the anomalies, thanks to Curbnet. Perhaps I'll do a proper anomaly hunt series. Who knows, but uh, when Kerbal Space Program 1.2 is released tomorrow, I'm sure I'll come back. Oh, hey! I realize there's now a sound effect of the landing gear going down. What a nice surprise to end the video on. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.